Hi, I'm Amelia Gregg with the Center for Aerospace and Exploration Technology Research, or CSETA, at the University of Texas at El Paso. Together with mechanical engineering students Antonio Rabali and Catherine Carrillo, we have been looking into the practicality of embedding electrospray thrusters into CubeSat rails to improve their utility while minimizing the size and weight penalty associated with carrying a propulsion system. We have recently demonstrated that common low cost manufacturing techniques can be used to directly embed an electrospray thruster with its associated propellant storage into a CubeSat rail, which we are calling the rail thruster, and demonstrated that the rail thruster functions. This presentation will outline the design, manufacturing and testing of the rail thruster concept, as well as present the next steps in advancing the technology. Electrospray thrusters are small electrostatic propulsion devices that accelerate a charged liquid propellant using electric fields to produce thrust. The rate of propellant emitted is very low, leading to low thrust, but in return, very low impulse bits for precision and high specific impulse for propellant mass efficiency. Electrospray thruster systems usually contain arrays of hundreds of microscale emitters in small areas on the order of a few centimeters squared or smaller. The small size makes them very well suited for small satellite applications. The thrusters have an emitter in close proximity to electrostatically charged grids. The electrostatic field deforms the surface of the propellant at the emitter tip, which creates a cone jet uh, and decreases the radius of the surface until the electrostatic force overpowers the surface tension. The propellant is then extracted as either positively charged ions or larger positively charged droplets, depending on the field strength applied and the propellant used. Ion emission gives higher specific impulse and lower impulse bits for precision control, whereas droplet mode sacrifices some of the specific impulse and impulse bit precision for higher thrust levels instead. The extracted propellant is accelerated away from the thruster and spacecraft by the same electrostatic field established between the emitter and the grids. A downstream electron source or neutralizer then neutralizes the residual charge in the propellant flume, enabling detachment from the spacecraft and momentum transfer or thrust. Alternatively, bipolar electrospray thruster arrays alternate between emitting positive and negative ions or droplets, creating a neutrally charged neutral charged plume and eliminating the need for the, the downstream neutralizer. The small size of electrospray thrusters makes them ideal for small satellite missions, especially constellations and other missions requiring precision maneuvering. The thrusters increase general mission utility through enabling orbit adjustments, primarily altitude raising or lowering and phasing. Changes to inclination are very high delta V, so would require a lot of propellant and time if you were to attempt those. Uh, electrospray thrusters also permit the formation of constellations through fewer launches by enabling the phasing and altitude adjustments from a single deployed orbit. The low impulse bit is perfect for precision maneuvers, including precision attitude control and or pointing, as well as precision orbit maintenance for formation flight by allowing the, the system to overcome perturbations to maintain the desired orbit with higher accuracy for longer times. Usable mission durations can also be extended through drag compensation and again overcoming the other orbital perturbations to maintain a well-defined orbit for longer durations as may be needed by a payload or a specific scientific observation. Electrospray thrusters are already very small mass and volume which is helped a lot by the fact they use a liquid propellant to eliminate large and heavy pressure vessels. The traditional placement of electrospray thrusters are standalone plug and play style units that attach as part of a PCB board or satellite face, for example. This is of course very good for the off the shelf benefits that make CubeSat so popular and widespread. However, for missions willing to sacrifice some plug and play ease for high utility, the electrospray design lends itself very well to being embedded directly into structural elements. They can be easily manufactured on size scales comparable to the dimensions of, say, a CubeSat rail, and the liquid propellant can be stored in hollow cavities inside the rail as it is not pressurized. Orthogonal arrays of embedded electrospray rail thrusters can be used for fine attitude adjustments 
or for a mission looking for higher thrust along a particular axis, multiple rail thrusters can be placed along the rails of that face or sharing a single propellant reservoir within each rail to increase total linear thrust. The design of the rail thruster is based around the requirements of the CubeSat design specification revision 13, specifying an 8.5 millimeter wide rail with one millimeter chamfers on each corner, leaving a 6.5 millimeter flat face on each side. Consequently, we made the rail thruster, including its propellant reservoir, five meters wide, five millimeters wide, sorry, and five millimeters deep. A length of 10 millimeters is chosen somewhat arbitrarily for the prototype as a nice even number to use for scaling performance to larger sized, longer sized rail thrusters. A single extractor grid is used with no accelerator grid to keep this design, this first prototype design, very simple. Similarly, the rail segment used to house this prototype thruster for testing is just simply a fraction of a rail 3D printed using PLA. For this prototype testing, it is simply a placeholder and it doesn't represent anything close to what the flight rail material or design might be. The design propellant is EMI BF4, which is a common electrospray propellant. And then for the actual thruster itself, there are 216 emitters in the array, which are roughly conical, each with 200 micron feature size for diameter and height. The emitters are made from porous glass cut using high precision CNC machining. The use of porous material permits propellant to be drawn through the emitter cone using capillary action in natural channels, which eliminates the need to micro machine artificial channels, decreasing the feature sizes of the thruster. A ground plate is used on the top face to lie flush with the rail surface to meet deployment requirements. The ground plate also electrically connects the extractor grid to the satellite stru structure to minimize the risk of arcing across the surface. The emitter array is biased relative to the extractor to produce the required electric field for emission with an insulated Maycore casing used to isolate the high voltages. For the prototype, the plastic rail segment eliminates the need for any additional electrical isolation of the charged propellant in the reservoir, but this will need to be considered further in future iterations leading towards a flight ready design. To manufacture the prototype, readily available low cost manufacturing techniques were used. The emitter array, made from borosilicate glass with about 10 micron pore size, was cut using high precision CNC with high spindle rates and a polycrystalline diamond cutter. The extractor grid is stainless steel 316 with the holes cut by laser ablation. To reduce costs in manufacturing the prototype, a trainee performed the laser ablation, leading to slightly lower tolerances and some imperfections in the cutting of the holes which you can see in figure eight in the center of the slide. The Mako casing was also machined using CNC and it features a stepped design that supports the relative standoff distances between the emitter array and extractor grid for easy thruster assembly. A vacuum rated epoxy was used to secure the components to each other during assembly. For this prototype assembly it was simply done by hand using a vice grip and tweezers, which led to a few alignment issues and some epoxy spillage blocking some of the emitter tips. But this was not considered an issue as this is just a low cost demonstration prototype for feasibility and the overall performance is not a critical factor in meeting our goal of this work. The wire connecting to the negative or grounded extractor grid and the ground plate was simply soldered to the outer face of the thruster for this prototype. Similarly, the ground plate itself was just held in place with conductive epoxy applied by hand, which leading to a very non-smooth surface for this prototype. Uh, these, mean, these features mean that the, the rail thruster prototype does not have a flush surface with the, the rail surface as required. However, using the plastic rail segment prevented connection of the grounded wires on any internal surfaces. Future iterations will feature conductive rail segments and that ground plate will be part of the rail itself. And so neither of these things will be an issue moving forwards. Thruster testing was performed at the University of Texas at El Paso Aerospace Center in the Plasma and Electric Propulsion Chamber or PEPSI. 
The chamber is three feet long, 30 inches in diameter, but for this prototype testing, uh, wall effects were not considered at all. A conductive plate connected to a picometer was placed downstream of the rail thruster to collect the emitted propellant and measure the current, the associated current. Voltages applied to the thruster were swept from 500 volts to 1500 volts. At a voltage of 1500 volts, the power supply began to trip internally, so we were not able to go any higher. The measured emission increases with increasing voltage as expected for an electrospray device demonstrating that the small scales and the manufacturing techniques used do work. However, the measured currents are very low compared to what is estimated by the theory. This is not entirely unexpected. As I've mentioned, low tolerance manufacturing imperfections in the extractor grid would lead to high levels of propellant impingement on the grids instead of allowing the propellant to pass through the holes. Um, misalignments from assembly by hand would contribute to a similar problem. And also, several of the emitter tips were blocked by the epoxy spillage, and these would not be contributing to the measured experimental current. Regardless, the trend of the increasing current with applied voltage is as expected, which demonstrates that the rail thruster design does work uh, and is worth further investigation. Rail thruster performance estimates were done using the theory uh, and indicate a specific impulse of 1600 seconds, a thrust of two micronewtons per rail thruster, and a delta V of two, uh, five meters per second per rail thruster. So these values have not been validated against the experimental measurements we made. Um, as I said, the imperfections in the prototype I mean the experimental results were much lower than they should have been for a properly designed thruster, and so there'd be no point in doing a direct comparison at this time. So using the theoretical results as a baseline for mission utility, two examples, you could use 12 rail thrusters to enable full three axis control as shown in figure 15. Um, and this would give you a total mission delta V of 60 meters per second. Or similarly, you could put six rail thrusters in each of the four rails that make up one face to give a total linear thrust of 48 micronewtons and a total mission delta V of 360 meters per second. This initial rail thruster prototype has demonstrated that the concept of embedding electrospray thrusters into CubeSat rails is feasible, but further development and improvements are needed. The design, including its associated propellant storage, fits within a standard CubeSat rail and can be manufactured using common and relatively low cost techniques such as CNC and laser ablation. The prototype was tested under vacuum conditions and an emission current was detected, although the values of the current were very low due to the low manufacturing quality of the low cost prototype. The rail thruster design lends itself very well to versatile placement around the structure of a CubeSat, enabling multiple mission maneuver capabilities based on whatever the mission requirements might be. The next steps we will take in this work are to manufacture a higher quality prototype with better tolerances and fewer imperfections. The ground wire protrusion on the rail face will be eliminated uh, by the use of a conductive rail segment and then direct measurements of thrust, specific impulse, impulse bit and efficiency will be measured under vacuum. Also, we are currently running mission scenarios to showcase the utility to specific mission cases such as formation flight and drag compensation so we can compare this to alternate technologies currently available. If anyone has any questions relating to this work, I will be available during the CubeSat Developers Workshop live Q&A session on Wednesday, April 28th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. If you are unable to attend that session, you are also welcome to reach out to me anytime through email, adgreg at utep.edu, through LinkedIn, or any of our other social media accounts. Thank you.